Hi everybody, I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm just carrying on where I left off last time. You realise you've turned us into a laughing stock, said Nancy Goodley. After all we've done for you, making you into a star. Clovis hung his head. He was crouched on a dirty footstool, clutching his stomach, which was heaving after the Paradiso breakfast of bean stew and fish bones. And he was covered in bites because the hotel sheets were crawling with bed bugs. It was all his fault. He knew that. And now even more things were going wrong. A banana boat had come in from Bellum the night before and the captain had told the manager of the Paradiso that the company had left there without paying their hotel bill. Since then, the manager shot out of his office whenever any of the actors came past, asking for money and threatening to take their clothes and belongings if they didn't pay. They had tried to put on a funny play that Mr Goodley had written instead of Fauntleroy, but it wasn't funny and had to be pulled out. And now, not only the hotel, but the theatre was losing money, and the management was threatening to cancel the second week of their booking. They were due to go on to Colombia and Peru, but how? Perhaps we could steal out of the hotel one by one at night. And hire a lorry, suggested the old actor with the flashing teeth. Hire a lorry with what? sneered Mr Goodley. Pebbles? Coconut shells? Clovis stopped listening. He felt as wretched as he had ever done, and frightened too. What was going to happen to him and to everyone? He could see himself staring into the dark pit of the theatre and listening to that awful tittering that had started everyone off. Two girls, high-pitched and cruel. One thing was certain, no one was going to get him onto a stage again. Only Maya was his friend. She'd promised to help him. She'd said there was something she could do. And he trusted Maya as he trusted no one else. The loud, angry voices crashed over his head. The room was sweltering. A centipede fell from the ceiling at his feet. Downstairs, someone opened a door and the smell of the dreaded bean stew came up and hit him. He couldn't face it again. He couldn't face any of it. Then suddenly, he sat up very straight. He didn't have to face it. Now that he wasn't acting anymore, he knew where Maya lived and Miss Minton, a few miles up the river to the north. The twins would like to see him, Maya had said on the boat, and Clovis saw them now, welcoming and kind. Yes, that's what he'd do. He'd go and find Maya. He had a few coins still. Someone would take him up to the river. And once he was with Maya and Miss Minton, everything would be all right. They would help him to get home. And Maya and Miss Minton together, they could do anything. Miss Minton's afternoon off fell two days later. She was going into Manus and Maya hoped she would ask her to go with her but she didn't. She was going to see if there was a reply yet from Mr Murray, but after the, that she had business to attend, she said. Since the Carters were going into the town to visit the only family in Manus with whom they were still on speaking terms, they could hardly help offering her a place in the launch. Where is Furo? asked Mrs Carter as one of the other Indians waited by the boat. Sick, said the man, letting his knees go soft and miming a fever. Oh, really? They are impossible, these people, said Miss Carter angrily. The slightest thing and they stay off work. Maya waved them off. Then she went into the sitting room and opened the piano. It was almost impossible to practice when the Carters were at home. She started on her scales, her apparagios, but sooner than she should have done, she began to play the chop and ballad. Um, she had been learning in London. She was so absorbed that at first she did not see Furo beckoning to, for her to come outside the window. He did not seem... He did not seem to be in the least sick. He looked, in fact, rather pleased and excited. Come, he said, making signs that she was to be quiet. Maya followed him. She was puzzled. During the day, the Indians always ignored her. It was only at night that they showed their true selves. Tappy and old Leela were standing at the door of their hut, smiling, but they said nothing, and Maya followed Furo to the creek she had found on the day she tried to go to Manus. By the wooden bridge, a shabby dugout was m moored. It was the one Furo used to go fishing in the evening. In, he said, holding out a hand. She hesitated only for a moment, then obeyed him. They travelled down a number of twisting rivers. Sometimes Maya thought she had been there before. Sometimes everything looked different, whether... Whenever she tried to question Furo, he shook his head, but he went on looking pleased. No one could have been more different from the Shirley boatman who had brought them to the Carters in the first place. 
They paddled down a side stream and now Maya did feel uneasy because Furo took out a square piece of cloth, put it over his own eyes to show her what she was to do, then over Maya's. Put on, he said, and when she shook her head, repeated it, leaning forward to tie the blindfold over her eyes. She began to be frightened. The boat eased slowly forward. She heard rushes making a dry sound against the side of the canoe, felt branches brushing her arm. Then the boat surged forward and Furo leant forward to unbind her eyes. They were in a still lagoon of clear blue water, shielded from the outside by a ring of great trees. The only entrance, the passage through the rushes, seemed to have closed behind them. They might have been alone in, in the world, but... It was not this secrecy of the lake that held Maya spellbound. It was its beauty. The sheltering trees leant over the water. There was a bank of golden sand on which a turtle slept, untroubled by the boat. Clumps of yellow and pink lotus flowers swayed in the water, their buds open to the sun. Hummingbirds clustered in an ever-changing whirl of colour round a feeding bottle nailed to a branch. On the far side of the lagoon, in the shade of two big cottonwoods, was a neatly built wooden hut, and in front of it, a narrow wooden jetty built out over the lake. A small launch with a rake smokestack and the letters Arabella painted on the side rode an anchor nearby, and made fast alongside was a canoe, which Maya recognised. But she did not at first recognise the boy who stood outside the hut, quietly waiting. He seemed to be the Indian boy who had taken her to Manus, but his jet black hair had gone, and so had the headband and the red paint. With his own fine brown hair, he looked like any European boy who has lived a long time in the sun, except that he didn't. He looked like no boy Maya had ever seen, standing so still, not waving or shouting instructions, just being there. And the dog who stood beside him was unlike other dogs also, a thin dog, the colour of dark sand, he knew when to bark and when to be silent, and as the punt drew up alongside the wooden platform, he permitted himself only a half wave of his tail. The boy stretched out his hand and Maya jumped out. I've decided to trust you, he said in English. She had known really before he spoke. Now she was sure. Maya looked into his eyes. You can do that, she said seriously. I wouldn't betray you to the crows, not for the world. The crows? Yes, that's the right name for them. So you know who I am? You're Bernard Tavener's son. The boy who Professor Glastonbury said didn't exist. But I don't know your first name. It's Finn, and you're Maya. And you sing beautifully, but you don't like beetroot and sums. Maya stared at him. How do you know all that? The Indians tell me. They see everything. Old Lily used to be my nurse when I was a baby, and I go and talk to them sometimes. At least I used to before the crows came but only at night. The Carters have never seen me and they never will. His voice when he spoke, to the Cartons, Car spoke of the Carters was suddenly full of hatred. It was you then, said Maya. It was you who whistled blow the wind southerly that first night I came. It was such a comfort. Finn turned and said a few quick words to Fuhrer in his own language. He'll fetch you in a couple of hours, he said. Come on, I'll show you everything and then I'll tell you why I sent for you. He grinned and pulled himself up. I mean, why I wanted you to come. When Furo disappeared through the narrow channel of rushes, the silence seemed overwhelming. Yet she heard the noise of the water lapping the Arabella, the whir of the hummingbird's wings, the dog yawning. It was, it was as though sounds had been freshly invented in this secret place. Finn led her to the door of the hut. My father built it and we lived here whenever we weren't away on the collecting trips. I still can't believe he isn't coming back, though it's four months since he was drowned. Do you see him sometimes? And I asked, and he turned sharply because she seemed to have read his deep thoughts. I, I see mine, my father, not a ghost or an apparition, J just him. Yes, it's exactly that. Often he's showing me something, a new insect or a plant. Mine shows me things too, little bits of pottery, shards. He was an archeologist. Mine was a naturalist. He collected over a hundred new specimens. I know. I saw some of the things in the museum. You must be proud of him. Yes, maybe that's the point of fathers. They're people that show you things. 
the hut was just as Bernard Tavener had left it when he went out with an Indian friend to look for the blue water lily whose leaves were used as painkiller. His collecting boxes and specimen jars, his plant press and dis dissecting, dissecting kit and microscopes were all stacked neatly on his work table. His carpentry tools were hung carefully on the wooden wall on the side of the hut was the tackle for the boat. The khaki sheets still lay folded on his hammock as though he expected to return to sleep that night. And in shelves made from palm wood planks were rows of old books, books on natural history, books on exploration and all the well-known classics. But the books that lay open on the table with a marker was Caesar's Gallic Wards in Latin. And as he looked at Finn, he sighed. He made me promise to go on with Latin, whatever happened. He said that there was nothing like it for sharpening the mind. But it's difficult on one's own. Yes, Maya nodded. Everything's difficult on one's own. But she thought she had never seen a place she liked more. The hut was spotlessly clean with a slight smell of wood smoke and the watery scent of the reeds coming in through the window. There was a small olive stove, oil stove, and a sink, but she could see that mostly the boy cooked outside on the stone fireplace built on a spit of land that ran between the hut and the sandbank. You must have been very happy here, you and your father. Yes, we were. I used to wake up every morning and think, here I am exactly where I'm meant to be. And there aren't many boys who can say that. I thought of waking up in those awful English boarding schools with a bell shrilling. He took her outside and showed her his oven. The place where the turtles laid their eggs. The bottle full of sugar, water, that he filled each day for the hummingbirds, just as his father had done. We've had 20 different kinds on that one, that one tree, he said. His bow and arrow were hung on a branch, but she had seen a rifle too, propped under the windowsill. Do you see that? He said, pointing to some marks in the sand. That's an anteater. He comes down at night to drink. His father had planted a simple garden, manoic and maize and a few sweet potatoes protected by a wire fence. It's difficult keeping animals out and keeping it weeded. It looks fine, all of it. She waved her hand over the hut and the boat, the lagoon. It looks like a place where one would want to stay forever and ever. He gave her a startled glance. Yes, but I can't stay. I'm going on a journey. Oh. For a moment she was devastated. She'd only just met him and now he was going. I'm going to find the Zanti. She waited. They're my mother's tribe. She was Indian. My father brought her here and she died when I was born. I promised him that if anything happened to him, I'd go there. He said they keep me safe till I was of age and then no one could make me go back to Westwood. I thought he was making a fuss, but now that the crows have come, how will you go? In the Arabella, as soon as the dry season starts properly. The rivers in the north are still flooded now, but it won't be long. They clambered over the boat together and it was clear that she was the apple of his eye. She was a steam launch, rackish and sturdy with a tall copper funnel and an aw awning running the length of her deck. My father got her cheap from some rubber baron who'd gone bankrupt. She came, she can do five knots when she's in a good mood. Can you manage her on your own? Just about. You have to have a lot of wood chopped at the beginning of the day and then you go on pretty steadily. It will be difficult because there aren't any reliable maps for the last part of the journey. I have to go by what my father remembered. Maya put her hand down on the tiller. Five minutes ago, she had wanted to stay in the lagoon forever. Now, just as much, she wanted to make the journey with Finn, to go on and on up the unknown rivers, not getting there, just, just going. But now the dog, who had been following them silently, jumped back ashore and made his way to the door of the hut, which he pushed open with his snout. He's telling us it's time for afternoon tea. Maya looked at him to see if he was joking, but he wasn't. Afternoon tea was exactly what Finn now produced. He put on the kettle, warmed the teapot, took down a tea caddy and measured out three spoonfuls of Earl Grey. Then he found a plate, for, filled it with biscuits, proper ones with sultanas and raisins, put out the sugar tongs and a milk jug. He even handed her a napkin. They might have been in the British drawing room. 
The dog waited. He only drinks China tea, said Finn, putting down a saucer and adding a spoonful of sugar. If you give him anything else, he looks at you. While they ate and drank, he made polite conversation, asking her how she liked Manus and whether her friend was still upset about the play. Clovis, do you mean? Yes, he is, but how would you know everything? He shrugged. The Indians here, and they tell me. The cleaner, the cleaner in the theatre is old Leela's cousin. When they had finished and swilled their cups, he said, Right, I suppose I'd better explain. I think I might need you to need your help, you see. Okay, that's all I'm reading today. I hope you've all enjoyed um, and I'll see you next time. Bye.